Well, thank you very much uh, to uh, Gabriele for inviting me to give this plenary, to uh, Marina Kini for introducing me, and to all of you for uh, staying on to the end, uh, to the very end of uh, this uh, long and dense conference. Now, since I'm going to talk about marked world orders, I'd like to begin back to front and uh, acknowledge my dues to uh, Bruno Di Biase, first of all, who should really be a co-author of this presentation. Uh, he uh, applied uh, the original 1998 uh, morphological schedules of PT to Italian, and then uh, he was uh, a substantial collaborator with Manfred Pinemann in, uh, when he produced uh, the uh, so-called extension in 2005. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to thank uh, my younger collaborators, Elena Nuzzo and Giorgia Ginelli, who uh, devised and organized the protocol for for eliciting the uh, marked and therefore rarer structures that uh, I will be dealing with, uh, collecting the data, transcribing them, coding them, and so on. And then, uh, of course, uh, I'd like uh, to thank Manf mention Manfred Pinemann, who uh, throughout uh, uh, kept uh, a kind of brotherly eye on uh, the application of his theory uh, to Italian. Uh, now, um, just a couple of words about the motivation. Um, as a very applied linguist, uh, I'd like to motivate uh, my work uh, with uh, uh, the in view of helping uh, uh, the learners uh, uh, to enhance uh, their communication. Uh, you can go a long way uh, with just canonical word order. Uh, but uh, uh, it helps the listener uh, if uh, you can uh, organize uh, your matter in a, more, uh, in a way that makes it easier uh, for them to understand uh, uh, the way you really intend uh, the message to come through. Uh, so uh, if uh, uh, Miss... Uh, if making an error, someone says uh, that the beer brings the professor, uh, you may be funny, especially in class. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, if you say that the thief has caught the police, uh, you may be in uh, big troubles, uh, maybe in court. And uh, if you do say, uh, uh, cosa tu vuoi, uh, with uh, an unnecessary subject, uh, you can sound very aggressive. In uh, real life, uh, especially in an immigration content, um, this uh, may cause uh, uh, some problems. So dealing with Italian, let me start with a couple of words about uh, uh, the uh, typological characteristics of the Italian language. There are two sources of language specificity. Uh, the lexicon and the C structures, which are linked via F structure. F structure is universal, but it is expressed in uh, a language specific way. Uh, with these regards, we have uh, uh, two important typological distinctions between uh, uh, more uh, configurative languages and uh, less configurational languages. Um, the uh, configurational languages uh, express F structures information by position. Non-configurational languages express it by uh, morphology mainly. Uh, the second distinction is uh, morphological, and it's between uh, uh, more head marking and more dependent marking languages. Uh, head marking languages indicate grammatical relationships inflectionally on the head element. Uh, the others, uh, they uh, indicate them inflectionally on the dependent element. Italian is uh, a more non-configurational language, uh, uh, which uh, uh, marks morphologically the head rather uh, than the dependence. Uh, here you have an example in English, if you uh, 
uh, change the canonical word order, you say something completely different. In uh, Italian, uh, you don't. It's just a different perspective on the same message, uh, but you mark uh, end uh, rather than but, you mark uh, the verb. Uh, Latin uh, marks uh, the uh, dependent elements, the nouns. Uh, Italian morphology is fusional and stem-based. There is no full word which is only the root. Uh, we always have uh, a, a morpheme at the end. Uh, a single vowel may uh, inform you about person, number, tense, mood, aspect, etc. in a verb. Uh, so it's quite complex. Uh, this uh, rich uh, morphology instantiates all pervasive and obligatory agreement patterns. Uh, obligatory and uh, uh, syntactically motivated. In terms of syntax, Italian is an SVO language. On the other hand, uh, all other possible orders are uh, possible. They are all grammatical. Some are quite awkward, depending very, very strongly on prosody, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, they do uh, exist. Now, going on to the main theory uh, with the framework in which I have been working with, um, I'm dealing with marked orders within uh, this framework. It is now uh, a mature uh, theory uh, based on the 1998 uh, uh, main work by Manfred Pinemann uh, with a new component added by Pinemann, Di Biase and Cavagucci in 2005. Um, which brings in uh, uh, um, pragmatic, pragmatics and discourse-motivated syntax. Uh, it's been applied uh, to ever more languages besides English and German originally in the work of uh, um, uh, Hokanson for, and Sayeli for Swedish, uh, Mansuri for Arabic, uh, Kawaguchi for Japanese, uh, Yanin Zeng from Chinese, uh, now there is uh, uh, Serbian as well, etc. Also new situations. Uh, Hokanson has worked with children with specific uh, language impairment. Uh, Agostini in Sydney has worked with with uh, uh, the acquisition of Italian by an autistic child, uh, with uh, Elena Favilla and Lucia Ferroni have been working to see whether the hierarchical uh, schedules uh, uh, work uh, uh, the other way around with loss amongst aphasic patients uh, and so on. Uh, there are new applications for testing and teaching. Uh, so uh, we are talking about a mature theory. Uh, according to Pinemann, it has the underlying logic that at any stage of development, learners can produce only those L2 forms which the current state of the language processor can handle. So um, I'm afraid I will spend a few words for the L2 forms and for the language processors, uh, which uh, are uh, giving us a perspective on uh, language production and linguistic knowledge and hence the two feeder, the two most important, the two feeder discipline theories that inform uh, processability theory. For language production, uh, they are uh, levels uh, model, and for uh, linguistic uh, knowledge, uh, they are the lexical functional grammar uh, by Bresnan. These two uh, formal uh, theories uh, interface very well. They are both lexical, uh, lexicalist, and um, in fact, uh, Level's model uses uh, for uh, language uh, representation uh, LFG, and also LFG aims uh, uh, to be uh, psychologically plausible. So uh, let's have a look first at uh, language production in uh, the mature L1 speaker. Uh, Level's model assumes that when we intend to say something, we select in the conceptualizer the information whose expression may realize our communicative goals. Since any state of affairs can be expressed in many different ways, in the conceptualizer we also plan the form of the message in the sense that we select the language, the registrar, the speech acts, etc. But we also assign topic and focus, mark the references given and new, and so on. So although preverbal, 
the conceptualizer's output already includes some information about the relative promin prominence of uh, its elements. So let us look at what happens in the lexicon, or how the lexicon is organized, and what happens then in the formulator. Uh, in uh, uh, the lexicon, words uh, are stored um, with their full bundles of uh, features involving three different types of information at the conceptual level, at the lemma level, and the lexeme level, uh, semantics, grammatical, and phonological. They are captured over three levels of representation. Uh, here is the same for a verb. Uh, previously, we had, uh, you know, the sort of little sketch for the noun. Now, um, uh, within uh, the formulator, crucial in uh, building up uh, uh, the sentence is uh, the functional uh, assignment, the functional processing. Um, it is the lexicon uh, with its associated uh, semantic, grammatical, and phonological uh, or information that primes the procedures in the formulator and feeds forward the encoder. Uh, now, functional assignment is crucial. It creates the syntactic environment for the word, and it's controlled by two kinds of information. The eventuality uh, conceived in the conceptualizer associated with the thematic roles and the relative prominence, uh, prominence amongst the participants associated with the attentional or discourse roles. And uh, you can have uh, the same eventuality with uh, uh, Romeo to start with, Juliet or the Rose. Uh, now, uh, when uh, um, you have uh, all this material uh, coming out of the uh, functional processing. Now, all this material uh, may contain indications of uh, uh, prominence, uh, but it is not organized in any uh, linear order. In order to do so, it has to undergo the process of uh, uh, positional uh, constituents, assembly, and uh, inflection. Uh, constituent assembly uh, fixes the linear order and captures the dependencies amongst syntactic functions. This hierarchical organization is assembled bit by bit under the control of the syntactic functions and the grammatical categories of the lemma that realize them. Why do we need to understand all that? Uh, because uh, what is totally clear in, this key, in the figure you have just seen for the L1 speaker, uh, and uh, all the procedures are uh, automatized, uh, automatic. Uh, the learner has uh, uh, not all bundles, the whole bundle of features uh, in, uh, for their lexicon, uh, nor uh, everything is in place uh, within the formulator. So you've got to build up your lexical store gradually. You've got to learn to encode the lemmas, both functionally and positionally. And you've got to learn, practice, and automatize uh, the process. Uh, while uh, this area keeps on being gray to various shades, uh, the um, short, short term memory load increases, uh, so uh, you fall back uh, on uh, default uh, choices, default solutions, uh, uh, and which are easier uh, to compute online. Uh, now, for the functionally and positional encode, now we turn to the second feeder discipline of PT and move on to a few. Uh, words on uh, uh, lexical functional grammar, uh, which provides a universally applicable formal grammatical representation, whereby a sentence is the expression of several types of information. These uh, constitute the levels of linguistic representation, and we have the argument structure, the functional structure, and the C structure. The information structure, the um, prosodic structure and the semantic structure. 
Now, uh, in bold, you have A, F, and C because they are the most elaborated. Uh, lexical functional grammar is still in the process of elaborating their own uh, models and uh, formalism for the other three structures. Now, important is not only um, the three structures, but also the mappings uh, between them. Let's see them first individually. A structure encodes information about the number and type of arguments selected by the predicate. And uh, these arguments are, with well-known hierarchies, uh, placed uh, in a kind of order, agent first, beneficiary, etc. So there is an hierarchy amongst these elements. And the arguments, of course, are assigned lexically through the meaning of the verb. The verb correre as agent, the verb love has experience, and the stimulus dare has three arguments. The F structure encodes information about grammatical relationships or functions and grammatical features. First, the functions. Uh, the functions are, as you see on the screen, subject, object, in, indirect object, the family of uh, the obliques, uh, the um, complement, adjunct, focus, and topic. There are two important dichotomies in uh, this, uh, um, uh, two important divisions uh, uh, amongst these uh, grammatical functions. Um, the first is between argument functions and non-argument functions. The argument functions are governed by the predicate. The non-argument functions bind their expression to something else than uh, the argument roles. There can be more than one in a sentence, and usually uh, they move uh, more freely around. Um, among the, uh, the um, argument functions, there is distinction between the core and non-core ones. The core ones are associated with the central participants in the event and are usually in languages distinguished formally. Most important for us is the dichotomy between uh, uh, discourse functions and non-discourse functions. Um, Non-discourse functions, whether argument or non-argument, they are represent the internal aspect of the clause. Uh, and also discourse functions represent the internal aspect of the clause. But they also relate the sentence to the wider discourse. Um, they're sometimes called overlay functions because they must be identified with a non-discourse function. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, there are two important um, uh, connections between uh, these uh, two tiers of discourse and non-discourse functions and argument and non-argument functions. One is that the subject is the only function which is um, a part of both dichotomies. It is an argument function and a discourse function at the same time. And the second is that by default, the topic is subject and the subject is topic. Uh, now, um, there was, uh, uh, within the F structure, we had functions and features about, uh, I'm going Oh, this is just an ex the examples of what I just said. Uh, about uh, uh, the grammatical features, uh, they belong to the lemma, and uh, I don't think I will, uh, they belong also to morphology. Today I'm concentrate on syntax, so I just go on. And uh, the third uh, structures, after argument structure and functional structure, that is of interest to us today, it's the C structure, which encodes uh, three types of information, the word order, uh, the constituent boundaries and the categories of each word and constituent. And again, uh, there is a, a hierarchy, first position, obviously, and then the other positions follow. It, too, has its own hierarchy. Now, not only is it important to have these three uh, structures, what is important is also the formal mappings between the hierarchical elements in these, uh, two, uh, these three structures. Now, uh, they can uh, be um, organized so that uh, the correspondences between these three structures are either by default or by non-default. Uh, here, uh, you have uh, an example uh, uh, whereby uh, the uh, 
correspondences, the mappings are all by default in the sense that the agent, which is the first in the argument structure hierarchy, uh, is mapped onto the subject and it appears in first position. Whereas here uh, you have uh, uh, the non-default uh, uh, mapping of the argument structure onto the functional structure because in first position you have the recipient rather than uh, the uh, agent. Here, uh, the uh, non-default uh, mapping is uh, between uh, uh, is uh, from the uh, constituent structure onto the functional structure. Uh, the agent is the subject, but it is not in a uh, first position. Now, uh, to summarize this part, uh, PT gets from levels model the lexical store to be built up, the encoding functionally and positionally of uh, the words and the automatization process and it gets from uh, uh, LFG the three different syntactic levels, the correspondences, the formalization of the correspondences between these levels and it gets uh, the discourse functions. Now we are coming to PT. For morphological development, and I think uh, in the audience you may be very familiar with this, uh, uh, what matters uh, is uh, um, uh, the learner's progress through a sequence of stages which depend uh, on the increasingly greater syntactic distance in terms of hierarchical levels between the linguistic elements requiring the exchange of information for their appropriate grammatical uh, production. It's not uh, Pinemann's wordings, but this is the gist. And uh, uh, you can uh, see uh, very briefly the universal uh, development, the schedule for the diverse development, implemented into Italian uh, by uh, Di Biase. And uh, you have this on your handout. And because it deals with morphological development, I will no longer mention it. I just mention it for the completeness of the theory. Uh, what I will be mentioning uh, from now onwards is the syntactic development which comes out of uh, the uh, extension of the theory in 2005. Um, now, the stages come about in this case as the learners gradually learn to go beyond the default solutions in linking functions to argument and constituents in order to use freer word orders motivated by discourse and grammatic uh, and pragmatic options. Um, the extension uh, is based on three hypotheses, the unmarked alignment hypothesis, the topic hypothesis, and the lexical mapping hypothesis. The uh, next two slides are on your handout, and they give the full schedules. Uh, on the screen, you will have the gradual breakup uh, of uh, them. Okay? So, the three hypotheses. The first one, uh, the unmarked alignment hypothesis. Learners will initially organize their syntax by mapping the most prominent semantic role onto the subject, which is the most prominent uh, uh, grammatical role. And the structural expression of subject, in turn, will occupy the most prominent linear position in the C structure, namely the first one. Uh, so, when uh, learners uh, can uh, at least distinguish nouns from verbs, having reached the category procedure on the old uh, PT schedule, um, they uh, begin uh, the verb, distinguishing nouns from verbs, the verb uh, begins to have its crucial uh, role in the sentence frame. And uh, the learners organize their sentences by sequencing their A roles. 
uh, by default and mapping them onto the linguistic structure. A canonical word order ensues in the target language. So, uh, one construct. <laughs> Canonical word order is the prevailing order uh, with which a language organizes its basic constituents of the C structure of the prevalent default type of string, which is the simple, active, affirmative, declarative, minimally, propositionally, and pragmatically neutral sentence. Um, the canonical word order is language specific. However, between the two possible orders discounting the verb, uh, it seems that SVO is uh, by far uh, the more uh, prevalent. Uh, now, a production of this um, unmarked alignment sta uh, stage uh, in Italian, la donna dare dare la donna dare li chiavi, so subject, verb, object, and uh, indirect object per amico, per su amico. Uh, within uh, this uh, stage, uh, you have also not only SVO, but also ProDrop. Now, thanks to the very predictability of canonical word order, uh, you do not need uh, to, uh, you do not need to um, uh, assign functions, really, to your words. Uh, you can go straight uh, at this stage from the A structure to the C structure without going via the F structure. Now, uh, on the other hand, we call it SVO. So by calling it SVO, uh, we give functional labels to canonical order. So there's a bit of a tangle there. I think it's more a kind of tangle of words. Uh, rather than saying first NP, V, and second NP, we call it subject and object because uh, we are so, so used to it. On the other hand, um, subject is a, a kind of universal concept. So um, learners do know what a subject is. They know it in their language. So uh, one could call it SVO even for the learners. The whole point is that Pinneman originally said it's underspecified. And what he means by that is that, yes, SVO, learners know what S is, and that the other one is O, uh, but what do they may not know is the full consequences of uh, the canonical word order and the full consequences of what it means to be a subject that can be dropped, for example, that can be moved, etc. These uh, further uh, characteristics of the subject and the object may uh, be learned gradually. Um, Beyond canonical order, uh, there is functional assignment. Uh, functional assignment is really what distinguishes the uh, beginner from the intermediate to advanced learner. Once learners assign their syntactic functions to phrasal arguments, that is, they build up their F structure, uh, their further progress uh, becomes uh, possible. Uh, when they wish to express their propositional content by taking a different perspective on it, functional assignment opens up a whole range of new structures, and it does so in two important ways. Uh, by placing in first position something other than the subject, you have the topic hypothesis. Uh, by assigning subject function ro to roles other than the agents, you have the lexical mapping hypothesis. Uh, you may remember, sorry, this is topic hypothesis and this is the uh, lexical mapping hypothesis, A onto F and this is, sorry, this is C onto F is the topic hypothesis. I will no longer mention the lexical mapping hypothesis. Uh, there is no time. That will deal with uh, um, word order of, uh, uh, may, uh, for example, unaccusative verbs, passives, uh, um, causative uh, uh, constructions, uh, exceptional verbs like uh, piacere, servire, etc., etc. I, I will no longer uh, mention that, but I will uh, uh, go on to the topic hypothesis. Learners 
after the unmarked alignment stage of the, uh, what was the other hypothesis, the unmarked alignment hypothesis, the topic hypothesis, <laughs> learners will initially not differentiate between subject and topic. But uh, the addition of something uh, before the canonical uh, word order string will trigger a differentiation between top and subject. Remember that in that dichotomy we said that the uh, subject was the only element that was uh, common to both the discourse dichotomy and the argumental dichotomy. And that uh, uh, by default, top is object and, ob and subject and subject is uh, top. So here uh, we start by inserting a new element in the sentence at the beginning. Uh, the learner is obliged to distinguish uh, between top and uh, subject. Now, if uh, the element in front is an, uh, uh, an adjunct, and that is a non-argument uh, function, uh, there, Italian needs no further adjustment in the sentence. So to begin with, uh, canonical word order uh, follows uh, uh, the initial element. So you have uh, uh, XP plus unmarked alignment, and here uh, you have disentangled the subject from the topic, but it's still followed by uh, a fixed order uh, sequence. Uh, more difficult it becomes when uh, the, the element in the front is uh, a core function, it's uh, the object. Uh, then uh, um, you have uh, adjustments to, uh, uh, then the following sentence uh, needs uh, uh, grammatical adjustments in order to signal the function of the initial topical element. Here you have an example of uh, the stage, uh, the topic hypothesis in disegno, in the drawing. Uh, bambini mangiano sandwich and in disegno B, loro mangiano gelata. Uh, notice at this stage still uh, the uh, uh, redundant uh, pronominal subject. Um, they do say at this stage you can put an object first instead of an adjunct, uh, is sandwiches, but what follows is again the order or it's not signaled that this is the object. The listener will take it as the subject and you have the mismatch of la birra porta il professore of the first slides that I showed you. So here you have now at the, the very last stage uh, the fronted element, topical element, which is a core function. Uh, at this stage, uh, the learner must, has learned to assign uh, grammatical functions independently from position, online to each of the participants in uh, the phrase. Uh, in Italian, uh, this is rather complex and it requires um, a um, uh, quite important morphological uh, skills. Uh, with canonical mapping at the lower stage, you have that Romeo, Bacia, Giulietta, you have the SV order. And notice how wide pragmatically the sentence is, what's happening. When you come to non-canonical mapping of C onto F structure at a higher level, you see how much more pragmatically restricted uh, and, fo and uh, directed uh, the listener attention is, who's kissing to Juliet, you're already narrowing your uh, um, uh, listener's attention, and Giulietta starts with what Bresnan calls functional uncertainty. Now you must signal that it's not the subject, otherwise the listener will take it as the subject. You must uh, mark it, and Italian, uh, I st said at the beginning, it's a head marking language, so it marks it with an object clitic on the verb. Uh, 
of course, the subject being occupied by the object, the first position, the subject then comes after the verb, and uh, you have the uh, subject-verb agreement marked on the verb. Uh, so this uh, comes about, that's more formally indicated. At this stage, uh, you can say, le patate fritte, le porta, the infermiera, with this le, co-referential clitic, with the object signaling and uh, re resolving the functional uncertainty of the topical element. Okay, now with questions. Uh, we have kept separate the declaratives from the questions. What happens with the questions? Okay. Uh, constituent questions, not yes, no questions, because yes, no questions in Italian uh, depend uh, on prosody, mostly. And uh, uh, LFG has not worked out the P structure yet. So limiting ourselves to constituent questions, they are marked pragmatically and linguistically. Uh, in Level's model, the speaker must decide early whether the message to be conveyed is declarative, imperative, or interrogative. So indicators of mood are already present by the time the, con the message reaches the formulator. Uh, focus is obligatory because it marks the mood uh, and undergoes specific constraints. These constraints vary cross-linguistically. Within the LFG uh, framework, there is a very good work by Louisa, Louise Mycock um, and uh, um, distinguishing uh, between in situ languages and fronting languages. In situ languages um, leave uh, uh, the uh, question word where the uh, gap is. Uh, fronting languages move it and signal it by putting it at the front. Uh, now, the question word has, uh, uh, bears uh, uh, two functions. Uh, it bears the discourse function, FOC, which is associated with the interrogative phrase. And uh, it bears uh, the grammatical function, which is associated with the gap. So, whom uh, is uh, uh, both focus, discourse function, and uh, in this case, um, direct object, uh, uh, the argument function. Sorry. This is more formal representation. Now, in terms of development, in terms of development, the unmarked alignment is non-existent in the development of interrogatives because this fronting focus is necessary, is lexically acquired quite early by learners in a fair large variety of lexical items, where, what, who, uh, and in fact, uh, many learners go on just with that. You don't even need the sentence to follow, but when the sentence does follow, you have this XP, which in this case, it's not the adjunct like in the declarative, but it is the focal element, it's the focus. Uh, and then you have, uh, at the next stage, uh, they produce uh, grammatical sentences. Um, uh, the uh, Italian outcome uh, would be uh, the FOC plus unmarked alignment would give you the uh, question constituent plus SVO, cosa Gabriele offre. Uh, at the following stage, you'd have the marked alignment uh, so you'd have cosa offre Gabriele with the VS, uh, the post-verbal subject. Uh, within the same stage, a much more complex structure which be the, would be the one in which you have both the topicalization of the element and the focal uh, foc. Uh, question uh, constituent, um, so you'd have il vino a chi lo offre, Gabriele. And you can even go a step further within the same stage, il vino a chi lo ha offerto, Gabriele, in which case, if the verb is in analytical form, it requires a further 
uh, agreement between the topic element, il vino, and the past participle of the verb. I haven't put it in. Uh... Now, having said all that, these are the predictions which you have on your handout of uh, how uh, marked word orders uh, will, would, with, would, will de develop in Italian. Um, do we have empirical evidence for it? Yes. Um, we have two sets of cross-sectional data. Uh, one is uh, with uh, 27 learners of Italian immigrants in Italy of various provenance and uh, uh, the other one is uh, with uh, uh, 12 learners and the native speaker um, cross-sectional data uh, for the development of constituent questions. Uh, the, I'm going forward, I want it to go backward. Um, I haven't had time, uh, maybe the written version which ha will have uh, numbers instead of plus and minuses, uh, but uh, you can see that from uh, canonical word order to the topic hypothesis with the fronting of the edge and then the fronting of the object, uh, it is a perfect fit. The hierarchy holds. Um, with the questions, since uh, Giorgia Ginelli provided us also with some figures. It is interesting to see how, again, uh, the fit is uh, just about perfect. Um, the only thing is that the, um, all subjects are already at the VS stage. In order to cope with the task of producing a lot of questions, not an easy one uh, to solve uh, in an in interview situation, but thanks to uh, Giorgia uh, Ginelli, Elena Nuzzo and Stefania Ferrari, we've been managed to have tasks eliciting questions, which is more difficult in, in, in Italian than in English, because we need the subject in a pro-drop language. So uh, learners are willing to produce plenty of questions, but if they leave out the subject, we don't know where they would place it when it's there. So uh, here uh, we can see with the figures, not just the plus and the minuses, but something quite interesting. Although they are all already at the uh, FOC plus VS uh, stage, uh, you see that the earlier learners have a uh, little pro-drop and pro-drop increases as they become more advanced. That's the first line here. The second thing to notice on the uh, table is that uh, the uh, more the less advanced students still alternate SV with VS after the FOC. So they produce some ungrammatical structures and some grammatical ones. Uh, the uh, more advanced learners no longer produce ungrammatical structures. Uh, not many uh, amongst the learners uh, start producing object topicalization. And uh, here we have uh, Mary and Eva who do produce some, but uh, they do not agree the past participle. That was the very last structure I mentioned. They do make um, the agreement with the topic and the clitic object marker on the verb, but they fail to make the agreement with the past participle. Uh, whereas uh, it's only Melanie who produces one token of a fully grammaticalized object topicalization with the analytical verb. Here you have a few examples of questions um, of various with and without pro drop uh, and uh, to conclude. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, learners and uh, speakers also in their L1 can go a long way by using only canonical order. But they need to change it in order to make the task for the listener a little easier. Uh, PT can account for the development beyond canonical order uh, and include not only syntax, but also interface with discourse and pragmatics. 
Italian, as a non-configurational language, provides an appropriate example of this kind of development. So we look forward to integrating LFG progress on especially the uh, prosodic structure and the information structure into the new developments of PT. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camilla, for this very, very clear presentation on the ultra new developments of PT, right? Work in progress. Most of it is work in progress, yes. both theoretically and empirically. So, you provided this link between theoretical and empirical development of a theory. Um, now, any questions? Thank you very much, Camilla. I have two questions. One is, um, I start from your definition of uh, processability theory that says that learners will produce only structures that their processor can handle, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what prediction, so that accounts only for production or does it explain comprehension as well? So does it, does it mean that a beginning learner of Italian, for example, um, who's at the first stage where they produce only the canonical unmarked SVO, can't really understand, understand uh, VS? Is that what it means? I suspect so, but we haven't done, I have no evidence and we haven't done any research. Now, I have put in quote that, uh, I go back to it, Manfred's words are in quote, but I have taken out the brackets and comprehend to make the slide shorter, but you've picked it up. Here. Okay. Uh, the underlying logic is that can produce brackets and comprehend. But I don't know of anybody who's done research on that, and I think it's about time that we did. But I do suspect that a beginner in confronted with uh, il ladro, lo prende la poliziotta, would not understand it correctly. Well, uh, there, it's but, there, yeah. there, is, there is some research, uh, obviously, you know, with learners perhaps, you know, from different populations from this one. I mean, this, yeah. I understand that most research has been done on naturalistic learners. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And my second question was, um, there's no role for the L1, right, in this approach? I mean, no. all, all learners are supposed to follow this natural sequence, is yes. that right? Yes. And do you have evidence that that's actually the case? Yes, our schedule is the same irrespective of uh, the L1 provenance of our 27 plus 12, uh, um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, again, I, I think that we, there, are, when there is we some can potential refine, uh, counter evidence there from, is plenty from of scope experimental research that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you can look at perhaps, you know, a natural developmental sequence with cumulative uh, effects of the L1 that also play, play, plays a role. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. Thank yes. You. yes, certainly. Um, my understanding is that much of the data has come from um, corpora of conversational data. Is that, is that correct? Um, Na I, natural, yeah, yeah. spontaneous, spontaneous conversation. Production, it's yeah. one of the tenets of the theory. It's online production within the normal circumstances of conversation. Oh, yeah. um, are there other kinds of um, elicitation? Do you have data from other kinds of elic elicitation tasks which would also involve online production? I mean, is it just conversational um, data? It's conversational, oh, spontaneous no. data. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, a, an elicitation task? Well, yes, with elicitation tasks, but uh, exactly the idea of a task is that the attention should be uh, of the learner, should not be uh, metalinguistic uh, in, used for putting together the sentence, but that they would be otherwise occupied and that they would produce online automatized, automatized kind of structures, yes. yes. Again, thank you, Camilla, uh, for this interesting 
presentation, but can you tell us something more about uh, um, the kind of tasks uh, you gave to, the, to collect data? Because you said conversation, and uh, if you can say something more, because it's, it's interesting to know. Yeah, uh, the uh, kind of most original task was the one eliciting uh, object topicalization. And that was originally called the, picnic, the animal picnic uh, by, devised by Bruno Di Biase. Uh, we had uh, a party and then uh, a trip. A party for eliciting uh, the structures in the present in a synthetic form and then in an analytic form we had uh, the trip. That is, uh, there was a party and everybody was uh, bringing something. And uh, we had uh, cards or came out of the screen. Sometimes um, the person was bringing something. Sometimes we had the object or uh, brought first. So you had to say, uh, le patatine le porta il professore. If the patatine came up on the screen first, you had to start with that. Uh, but uh, the idea was then to remember who brought what, and so uh, chi ha portato questo, and sometimes on the screen uh, the um, um, person would appear, other times uh, uh, the object would appear. And so uh, with that we kind of made all sort of combinations of uh, um, morphologically marked singular and uh, plural and feminine and, uh, um, and uh, masculine uh, objects and singular and plural subjects in order to see uh, what kind of agreements they came up with, yeah, the whole combination of them. Uh, thank you, uh, Camilla. I would uh, uh, be curious to, uh, to uh, know whether you also investigated also ca uh, other kinds of marked orders of Italian, for instance, cleft sentences, and what would you um, expect to yeah, find? Uh, in the unmarked alignment stage, uh, the object topicalization is uh, chosen as the kind of prototypical one uh, where you have the object in the front and the subject is postverbal. Now as well as uh, il vino uh, lo porta Gabriele, we can also have lo porta Gabriele, for example, or um, so you have no object. You only save the subject. I mean, there are other structures. Uh, but the most prototypical, the one that tells you most of, is when you put the object in front. Uh, having occupied the first position with the object, the subject coming after the verb is a kind of consequence of that. And uh, there are, of course, stages within that marked alignment stage. There is much more stuff that can go in many more structures, uh, but we've taken that as, as the prototypical one and uh, we haven't analyzed, but they would belong to the same uh, thing. And then obviously another limitation of the work we've done so far is uh, we've done no subordination, so this is the simple sentence. Hi, uh, this is uh, more of a comment. Um, because I don't think it's answerable right at the moment, but the current slide uh, shows that there are two feeder theories. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, two feeder theories, uh, language, that's Lavold's language production model and a linguistic knowledge, and they are very elegantly, you've displayed them very elegantly, and, uh, but I suppose the question uh, for Pienemann 